and practice the religion that they choose. Religious freedom continues to be severely curtailed, including through mandatory political education for political leaders and arrests of Tibetans who display um, or even possess a photo of the Dalai Lama. Oh, yeah, we are. Um, several buildings. Um, I think I have to. So I, Five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, uh, and welcome to, today, to the, today's hearing on the uh, of the Congressional uh, Executive Commission on China on the human rights situation in Tibet and the international response. While the world has rightly focused on the crimes against humanity and perhaps genocide in Xinjiang and the dismantling of Hong Kong's autonomy and rule of law, the human rights situation in Tibet continues to deteriorate. More than 60 years have passed since the Dalai Lama escaped into exile, and Tibetans in China are still struggling to exercise their basic rights, to speak and teach their language, protect their culture, control their land and water, travel within and outside their country, and practice their religion as they choose. Religious freedom continues to be severely curtailed, including through mandatory political education for religious leaders and arrests of Tibetans who display or even possess a photo of the Dalai Lama. Several buildings at religious centers of, of, of Tibetan Buddhist learning have been demolished. Religious practitioners have been expelled from Larangar and Yashingar, which used to be the home of thousands of Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns. It has now been 25 years since the 11th Panchen Lama was abducted and forcibly disappeared, making him one of the world's longest detained prisoners of conscience. We continue to call for his immediate and unconditional release. Uh, this year, ethnic unity regulations were passed that mandate acceptance and promotion of government, ethnic, and religious policy. There has also been a Chinese government-led effort, misleadingly referred to as bilingual education, instituted in minority areas throughout China, that mandates schools and teachers shift to Mandarin as the language of instruction. These violations of linguistic rights in Tibet are also being implemented in Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia, where new limits on Mongolian language instruction recently sparked large-scale demonstration. Uh, in the name of poverty alleviation and environmental protection, Tibetan herders and nomads are under pressure to give up their traditional land rights and way of life, dis displaced according to the whims of the government and business. Make no mistake, Chinese authorities are engaged in a systematic effort to eliminate the distinct religious, linguistic, and cultural identity of the Tibetan people. They are in clear violation of China's in international obligations to protect human rights and religious freedom, and to respect the rights of indigenous peoples and tribal and ethnic minorities. Access to Tibet remains tightly controlled with journalists reporting that it is difficult to visit Tibet. It is, it is as difficult to visit Tibet as North Korea. As a result, human rights abuses and environmental degradation are concealed from the world. In 2018, Congress passed the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, and I was heartened to finally see the Trump administration implement this legislation by restricting visas for Chinese officials involved in blocking access to Tibet areas. However, a special coordinator for Tibetan issues has still not been appointed as mandated by law. Every other U.S. president of the last two decades has made this appointment. Not doing so sends a signal that the human rights of the Tibetan people are not, are not a priority for the president or the U.S. government. I am very concerned about recent reports that a, 
uh, systemic and large scale training and that a, that a systemic and large scale training and transfer of Tibetan rural surplus laborers to work in factories is taking place. This program seems eerily similar to Uyghur forced labor abuses and have been well documented by this commission. I am also concerned about the targeting of the Tibetan uh, diaspora, including such tactics as allegedly engaging a New York police officer to gather intelligence for the Chinese government about the New York Tibetan community. I look forward to hearing more about these issues from our witnesses today. In a white paper last year, the Chinese government restated its claim that it has the sole authority to control the next reincarnation of the Dalai Lama in clear violation of the religious freedom of the Tibetan Buddhist community. In light of new threats to interfere in the reincarnation process and the increased human rights violations, U.S. policy towards Tibet needs to be updated and it needs to be strengthened. In January 2020, the House of Representatives overwhelmingly passed the Tibetan Policy and Support Act by a vote of 392 to 22. Uh, at, at, a, at a time when Democrats and Republicans can't even agree on what to have for lunch, this bipartisan uh, bipartisanship shows overwhelming support for human rights uh, in Tibet and for the Tibetan people. This legislation would establish a U.S. policy that the succession or reincarnation of Tibetan Buddhist leaders, including a future 15th Dalai Lama, is an exclusively religious matter that should be decided solely by the Tibetan Buddhist community. Uh, state that uh, Chinese officials who interfere in the succession or reincarnation process will be subject to targeted sanctions, including those contained in the Global Magnitsky Act. Strengthen the role of the State Department, the special coordinator for Tibetan issues by including a mandate to work multilaterally. Mandate that no new Chinese consulate should be established in the United States until a U.S. consulate is established in Tibet. Direct the State Department to begin multinational efforts to protect the environment and water resources of the Tibetan Plateau and support democratic governance in the Tibetan exile community. It is long past time for the Senate to act on this legislation. Frankly, I'm not sure why it has not moved forward. I hope that my Senate colleagues and all the supporters of human, uh, all those who support human rights in Tibet uh, will contact uh, the leadership uh, in the Senate and ask them to pass this bipartisan legislation as soon as possible. Our hearing today will examine the current situation facing Tibetans, both inside China and globally, explore restrictions on linguistic and religious rights, and identify diplomatic and multilateral options to address restrictions on access and the process of religious succession. Um, and I, 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 I can't see him, but I'm now going to, uh, um, okay, I'm not sure whether Senator Rubio here is on the line or not. Uh, I don't see him yet, but we'll, we'll go to him. Uh, let me, um, let me, uh, before we go to uh, Senator Rubio, let me ask uh, whether uh, is um, any of my other colleagues would like to, uh, to say anything. Um, and I see Senator King. Um, I don't know whether you'd like to make a few opening remarks. I, I really don't have any additional comments, Mr. Chairman. You covered the field well, and I'm anxious to hear from uh, from our witnesses today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is, uh, is Representative Chris Smith? Mr. Smith is in the Africa subcommittee, is, is in the Africa hearing, but he would like to uh, address, he has uh, remarks that he would like to give when he returns in a few minutes. Okay, all right. Um, I, I see. Uh, Mr. Swazi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll wait until uh, the witnesses have a chance to speak and then uh, make a statement and ask some questions at, the, at that time. Um, Senator Cotton or Senator Daines? Um, Representative Hartzler? No, I, I'll withhold uh, my comments till later. You've, uh, you've covered a lot already, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and my uh, Andy Levin. I see. Senator I too will wait, Mr. Chairman. Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm looking up. forward to asking questions. Uh, and I see uh, Senator Peters. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll also defer till uh, after the witnesses have a chance to make their presentation. 
All right, so we're, everybody's deferring. All right, so I'll, I'll now go to the, I'm proud to uh, introduce our esteemed panel of expert witnesses this morning. The panel includes C. Kiap Rinpoche, uh, who was recognized by His Holiness the Dalai Lama as a reincarnated Lama. His, his, his lineage has close co uh, connections to um, Tashi Lumpo um, mo uh, uh, Monastery and the, and the, and the Pachin Lama. Um, let me urge everybody to put your um, mic on mute. I can hear some. Okay. Um, Rinpoche has completed over three decades of Buddhist studies at key centers of learning in India. He was appointed the abbot of Tashi Lumpur Monastery, Monastery in South India by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, Matteo Makachi serves as the president at the International Campaign for Tibet. He previously served as, in the Italian parliament as a member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies, during which time he served as chairperson of the Italian Parliamentary Group for Tibet. He also served as an elected official of the OSCE uh, Parliamentary uh, Assembly. Um, uh, uh, Tenzin Dorji uh, is a Tibetan activist, writer, and senior researcher and stra strategist at Tibet Action Institute, graduated from the Tibetan Refugee School System in India, and immigrated to the United States under the Tibetan Resettlement Project's Family Reunification Program. He's the former director of Students for Free Tibet. And last but certainly not least, uh, Sophie Richardson. Uh, she's the China uh, Director at Human Rights Watch. Dr. Richardson is the author of numerous articles on domestic Chinese political reform, dem democratization, and human rights in Cambodia, China, Indonesia, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Vietnam. She's testified before the European Parliament uh, and the United States Senate and House of Representatives on many occasions. So I want to thank you um, for all being here today. And we look forward to hearing your testimony and we will begin uh, with uh, uh, Rinpoche. And just make sure you unmute, okay? Nada rinde ari chozogi tumi kushabje me gawan ani chobe chozogi tumi nyamsi nyamsi ba namba zo tamolo liya shi jeni kita zata shi lumbi tsapshu de ani tamji tang ani tarinde tam kunsi penjer muzi ki nedu ki tola tam shi ki pokap Nowadays, Jinsun Kana the 
Ani Benjin Kunjin Gubat Chubadam Chukchi Munjin Tebe Zebal Tene Nanga and Shinchi Chagiori, Tinji in the Dela Tene and Tari Naranzo Rebe and Sum Shuyu and a Tangote and a Chino Consecum which Macho in Sigitalia, Chino Consecum which Macho Kuniki, any combat in Gunshin Combat and Tarana Shikuniki, Tajo Kana, she soon get twenty Chimba Mado, Yana should get teacher Tolia, Tajo Tawa in the Chicho Maris Shuji Tang, Tarana. Tandabo the Pedin Tolle, number two, Gabjo Nami Gitolia, and a Tibet policy Jebe, and Chimja de Dalia, Jogondam, and a Gabjo Shuce and Roche Shuadan, Sumba Deli, Tama, and Nichigi, Ari Shunde, Shunde, my in the Sova Samegi, and a Jikunzi Benjamin Bucheda, Kuyavin Kuko, the Chadir Bucella Sova, the Dag, Nedang Telia, and Tishi Nebutone, and Bezer Nangutan, and Dead and Jenny, and Mazoria, Javanaro announced Shuajidan, and Tarilaria, and the Tamshi Kokana. In Chairman McGovern, Chairman Rubio, respected members of the Commission, thank you for organizing this very important hearing and the opportunity to speak today. I am the abbot of Teshilumbu Monastery. My monastery was founded by the first Dalai Lama and for 500 years has served as the seat of the Panchen Lama, one of the most important figures in Tibetan Buddhism with spiritual authority second only to the Dalai Lama. The Panchen Lama is of immense significance to my monastery, to the six million Tibetans in Tibet, and to the millions of Buddhists worldwide. In 1995, His Holiness the Dalai Lama recognized a six-year-old boy, Kinjun Chuegi Nima, as the 11th Panchen Lama. Three days later, the Chinese government abducted this boy, making him the world's youngest prisoner at the time. 25 years have passed since the Panjil Lama's abduction. Despite persistent appeals from concerned governments, UN bodies, rights groups, and sympathetic individuals across the world, the Chinese government to this day refuses to provide verifiable information about the Panjil Lama's whereabouts, his well-being, or evidence to prove that he is even alive today. Instead, China has propped up another boy as the Panjin Lama, a false reincarnation whom we Tibetan Buddhists do not accept. China's glaring lack of accountability over the kidnapping of such an important religious figure and a child at that is an outrageous and unprincipled act. This violates the very basic rights that Tibetan Buddhists should have to choose our own spiritual leaders. It begs the question, why did the Chinese government kidnap a six-year-old boy, the genuine reincarnate, and prop up a false Panchen Lama? In Tibetan history, the unique relationship of the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama is well known. The popular saying is, as the sun and the moon in the sky, so is the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama on earth. Since the 17th century, the Panchen Lamas and the Dalai Lamas have played key roles in recognizing and teaching each other's reincarnations. In the past century, the ninth Panchen Lama helped identify His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, who in turn recognized the 10th and 11th Panchen Lamas. Given this traditional practice, the Chinese government will surely use its false Panchen Lama to interfere in the selection of the next Dalai Lama and other high reincarnates. Therefore, all of us Tibetan Buddhists the world over and supporters of religious freedoms should be deeply concerned. It is clear that the Chinese policy over Tibet is a deliberate attempt to remove from the face of the earth our racial and cultural identity. This is clearly seen in the way the Chinese government interferes and intervenes in the functioning of the monastic education system by imposing restrictions on our monks and nuns. Even in our schools, we see this maligned design to wipe out our unique identity in the form of restructuring the curriculum and banning the learning of Tibetan language. In short, there is a continuous and systematic destruction of our culture religion, language, and environment in Tibet. Therefore, to safeguard the rights of the Tibetan Buddhists worldwide, 
to choose our spiritual leaders without interference by the Chinese government and to secure the release of the Panjin Lama, I respectfully offer three suggestions to this commission. First, for the crucial issue of the selection of the next Dalai Lama, the entire matter should be left to the total discretion and vision of the Dalai Lama without any interference and imposition from CCP. Please do devise a coordinated strategy to, in unity with allies and present a strong collective stance to challenge CCP's authoritarian regime's ominous moves on this matter. Second, please work towards establishing similar contact networks with the many Tibetan parliamentarians, support groups, and caucuses that exist around the world. These contact groups could facilitate the sharing of model resolutions and legislations, such as the Tibet Policy and Support Act among its members. Third, I call upon sympathetic governments, NGOs, and Tibet support groups to investigate the whereabouts of the Panchen Lama and those abducted with him so that we have a clear and accurate information on their whereabouts, including current photos of the Panjin Lama, his family members, and Chattel Rinpoche. We simply cannot keep urging transparency from China, which has shown no intention of transparency on this matter and other human rights issues. Lastly, I request the U.S. Senate to approve the Tibet Policy and Support Act. If passed, this legislation will bring much needed hope to the Tibetan people as they struggle to survive during this dark period of persecution and illegal occupation by China. Thank you for the honor of testifying before you, and thank you for your ongoing support of human rights and religious freedoms of the Tibetan people. Thank you very, very much. We'll now turn to Matteo Mutaki. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Chairman McGovern, Chairman Rubio, members of the commission, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Tomorrow is the 71st anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. And while every nation is entitled to celebrate its founding, no government should lose sight of the fact that its first and main responsibility is to serve and protect all its citizens by respecting their fundamental rights. Since the People's Republic of China invaded Tibet almost 70 years ago, it has kept a very tight control on all aspects of Tibetan life. The deterioration of human rights in Tibet today continues to be very serious. Over the last four years, Freedom House has consistently ranked Tibet as the second least free region of the world, only behind Syria. Tibetans can be persecuted for their beliefs, and to ensure government surveillance on Tibetan monks and nuns, police stations have been opened inside or next to monasteries. Tibetans can be arrested simply for owning photographs of the Dalai Lama or celebrating his birthday or for watching videos of his teachings. Mm -hmm. China is also trying to control the Tibetan reincarnation system, as we just heard from Rinpoche. Perfect. After abducting the Panchen Lama and his family when he was just six years old in 1995, the Chinese Communist Party now plans to select the next Dalai Lama, an absurd claim that the international community needs to challenge decisively. And there are encouraging signs from European governments, the United Nations, in addition to the State Department. At the end of August, Xi Jinping presided over the seventh Tibet World Forum held in Beijing. The meeting's proceedings indicate the Chinese leadership will continue its policy of control and assimilation in Tibet. Worryingly, Xi Jinping called for the patriotic re-education of the younger generation of Tibetans and asked the officials to look and act strengthening ideological and political education in schools, put the spirit of patriotism throughout the entire process of school education at all levels and types, and plant the seeds of love in China in the depths of the hearts of every teenager." End of quote. In a report released on September 22nd, scholar Adrian Zenz documented the large-scale program established in the Tibet Autonomous Region that, the first, that in the first seven months of 2020, push more than half a million rural Tibetans, half a million rural Tibetans, off their land and into military-style training centers. These are staggering numbers. 
After their course training, at least 50,000 of them were sent to other areas of Tibet and China and pushed into low-wage factory and construction work. The report highlights the Chinese authorities' attempts to eliminate Tibetans' traditional lifestyle, their unique identity, and their way of thinking. It also highlights disturbing similarities with the system of coercive vocational training and labor transfer established, established in Xinjiang over the last few years. In the wake of this new report, more than 60 parliamentarians from 16 countries from the International Parliamentary Alliance on China have issued a statement demanding urgent action to confront such policies. As we discuss how the United States and the international community should shape and adjust its policy, it must be noted that under the leadership of Chairman McGovern Rubio, at the end of 2018, the U.S. Congress passed the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, the yes. first legislation to apply the principle of reciprocity in U.S.-China relations. As documented by the State Department in its, in its latest report, the Chinese government continues to keep Tibet under lockdown. And as a result of this legislation, last July, the State Department, for the first time, banned from the United States the Chinese officials who are responsible for blocking Americans' access to Tibet. This call for reciprocal access to Tibet has also been endorsed by MPs throughout the world in an op-ed published last June by over 50 European MPs following a report by my organization. There is a growing awareness in European capitals and in Asia of the challenge posed by the authoritarian model of development promoted by Beijing. Calling for reciprocity, not only on economic and financial issues, but also for civil liberties and human rights is an effective way to challenge China's narrative, but this should be done in a strategic, well-coordinated and international fashion, which is still not the case. Last January, the House of Representatives, as mentioned by Chairman McGovern, passed the Tibetan Policy and Support Act. This is now before the Senate, and we call on Senator to pass it before the end of the year. Tibetan Americans, ICT members, Tibet supporters have sent several thousand petitions to Senate offices urging support for TPSA. This would be a powerful message of hope to the Tibetan people who are otherwise faced with daily oppressive policies by the Chinese authorities. The legislation affirms that it's only up to Tibetan Buddhists to select the next Dalai Lama without any government interference. It acknowledges also the fragility of Tibet's environment and the key role Tibetans play in its preservation. TPSA also expands the mandate of the Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues, a senior position at the State Department, which unfortunately has never been appointed during the last four years. The absence of a Special Coordinator could be one reason why there hasn't been much movement on the Tibetan dialogue process, process from the administration side. With only a few months left in the current term of the administration to do anything meaningful, the next administration, whether it's Republican or Democratic, should quickly appoint the Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues at the undersecretary level not at the lower level position, because doing that will send the wrong political message of diminished U.S. support for Tibet, both to the Chinese government and to the Tibetan people. While talking about the post-election administration, we have launched a Tibet 2020 campaign so that the presidential candidates of both parties are apprised of the American people's strong desire for Tibet to be a high priority. We look forward to working with the White House and Congress in our common objectives of supporting the people of Tibet to regain their rights and dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, before we go to our next witness, I'm going to yield to our co-chair, uh, Senator Rubio, uh, for anything he would like to say. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I'll be very brief. I'm sorry I'm late, and it's been pretty crazy here, and trying to, I haven't even left the house yet. So um, I appreciate you holding this hearing, Chairman, and, and obviously this is a very important issue. I hope that we can act legislatively on it. We have to continue to talk about Clearly, the, the outrages we've seen with the Uyghur population in Xinjiang is something we need to continue to focus on. But the ongoing abuse of the Tibetan people, the effort to strip them of their ethnic and religious identity is, is an outrage that's been documented for a long time, but one that we cannot lose focus on and one that we need to continue to update, as I just heard the previous witness say, update our, our foreign policy to continue to reflect for it. So thank you for holding this hearing. I, I, I'm late, so I don't want to take up any more time. I know everybody's running around and with different things going on. So I appreciate it. And, um, and thanks for holding this hearing. Thank you very much. I now yield to Tenzin Dorji. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Co-Chair Mr. Rubio, and members of the Commission for allowing me to testify on behalf of the Tibetan people. Over the course of seven decades, the Chinese government has waged an unrelenting campaign of violence and coercion aimed at eradicating the Tibetan people's faith, identity, 
and way of life. As China becomes a global power, the threat it poses to freedom and human rights goes far beyond Tibet. Beijing's surveillance and influence operations are undermining the liberty and security of those living in America. China uses a sophisticated set of tools, tactics, and strategies to conduct what I would call repression without borders. One strategy is the weaponization of access, access to markets, to family, to funding. By carefully controlling access, China buys the silence of American individuals and corporations, even Hollywood and the NBA. Of special relevance to Tibetans is China's visa as bait strategy. The Chinese government weaponizes access to family in order to coerce exiled Tibetans into silence and political impotence. They do this through a visa policy that is blatantly racist against Tibetans. Let's say you are a Tibetan American applying for a visa at the Chinese consulate. There is a main window where everyone checks in, but you can't use that window because you are Tibetan. You are taken to a separate area where a liaison officer interviews you. You have to write a personal statement in which you narrate your whole life history, name all the groups you have ever joined, and state whether you have ever participated in a protest. Each piece of information is a data point that the consulate might use against you later. Most importantly, you have to provide the names and IDs of your relatives in Tibet. So the Chinese government knows who you are and knows who your relatives are. Now the fate of your relatives is somehow your responsibility. They are the hostage, you are the target. Then the consulate makes you wait, sometimes for up to a year. Eventually, the liaison officer calls you in for a longer interview. He'll ask you again, have you ever participated in pro-Tibet activities? When you say no, he shows you a photo. It's a photo of you attending a teaching by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. That settles it. Beijing has your data and you have no visa. In one disturbing case, the liaison officer knew things he had no business knowing. He knew that the Tibetan visa applicant had a dog. He knew what breed the dog was. He even knew the dog's name. His message was clear, we are watching you. This insidious campaign to control exiled Tibetans in order to divide the community and kill the movement is bolstered by the rise of WeChat. While ordinary apps are platforms for expression and communication, WeChat is the ultimate platform of censorship and state surveillance. It facilitates the transnational repression that Beijing employs to silence overseas dissidents and activists. The same regime that threatens the lives of Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Hong Kong citizens on the other side of the world is threatening the rights of American citizens here. I urge Congress to ensure that Chinese consulates abolish their racist visa policies and stop the surveillance and intimidation of American citizens. Since 2009, over 166 Tibetans have self-immolated to protest Chinese rule. Today, Tibetans in Tibet are using the tiny amount of space they have to wage small but important campaigns to defend their language, to protect the environment. My colleagues have documented 71 such incidents between 2015 and 2019. Tibetans fight for human rights, the freedom to use their language, the freedom to worship freely. These rights are tied together by a deeper yearning for political freedom. Beijing wants to depoliticize the Tibet issue. I urge you to repoliticize it. Tibetan freedom is a truly bipartisan cause that brings Democrats and Republicans together. I humbly ask you now to lend your moral and political authority to initiate a multilateral and coordinated effort to support Tibet's right to self-determination. One concrete action Congress can take is to recognize Tibet's historical status as an independent nation and its current status as a disputed territory. That itself will change facts on the ground. Language has the power of action, and Congress has the power to set precedents. After all these years, the Chinese government has lost the battle for the hearts and minds of the Tibetan people, and its insecurity is making it increasingly bellicose. But the Tibetan people continue to resist with courage and patience. They know that freedom struggles take time. They also know that freedom often comes when it's least expected.
Tibetans have never given up on their struggle for freedom, and neither should we. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, finally, I want to yield to Silk Richardson. Good morning, Chairman McGovern and Chairman Rubio, members of the Commission. It's always a privilege to be with you. Uh, following the 2016 detention of Tibetan language rights activist Tashi Wangchuk, a spate of protests about language across the Tibetan plateau and concerns articulated by people inside and outside Tibetan areas, Human Rights Watch documented this year Chinese government policies and practices related to mother tongue education for Tibetans. What did we find? First, that the Chinese government's use of the term is deeply misleading. It is not the case that students across Tibetan areas are being taught equally in both languages. State policies are in fact uh, leading to the gradual replacement of Tibetan by Chinese as the medium of instruction, except for in a single Tibetan language class. Second, that while this trend has been visible in urban secondary schools, we're now seeing so-called bilingual education increasingly in primary schools and even in kindergartens and increasingly across rural areas. Third, some of the tactics that we detailed included indirect pressure on primary schools, including the employment of only Chinese speaking teachers, while at the same time requiring all Tibetan teachers to be fluent in Chinese. Uh, regional policies promoting what are referred to as mixed classes or concentrated schooling mix together Tibetan and Chinese speaking children, which is fine to justify the use of only Chinese in the classroom, which is not. Uh, the third tactic we looked at was the lack of and or diminishing use of Tibetan language texts and other materials such that relevant materials are, are really now very difficult to find, let alone use. In some, it's an approach to schools and school children that appear to be eroding the Tibetan language skills of children and forcing them to consume political ideology and ideas contrary to those of their parents and their community. Chinese authorities claim that this approach is improving education and employment opportunities, but the imperatives are clearly highly politicized and assimilationist. Global evidence shows that children's educational development is adversely affected, particularly in the case of minority and indigenous children when they are not taught in their mother tongue in the early years of education. The broad policy justifications, including ethnic mingling and poverty alleviation, seek to integrate Tibetans into the Han majority, into the mainland uh, economy, and to Communist Party ideology at the expense of Tibetans' rights to culture, livelihood, and religion. It's worth pointing out that Human Rights Watch's in-house experts on children's rights and education who work globally were truly taken aback at the extent of patriotic education for children as young as three or four. The outcome, I think, is painfully obvious. Cultural and linguistic erasure for Tibetans, further protests, and parents who actually clearly wanted genuine bilingual education deeply alienated. And increasingly, I think we have to be concerned as we watch these issues play out, not just as we have in Hong Kong or in Xinjiang, but now increasingly, as Mr. McGovern mentioned, for communities of Mongolian speakers and now even Korean speakers. Uh, a quick word on what human rights law has to say. China's 2001 law on regional national autonomy actually sets out protections for mother tongue education, especially at the kindergarten level. Uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to which China is a party, and the ICCPR, to which China is the signatory but has not yet ratified, uh, guarantee children the right to use their own languages. And the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which China has endorsed, sets out not just rights to indigenous language education, but the rights of indigenous communities to make decisions for themselves about education and what language ought to be offered. Uh, UN experts first uh, started critiquing the Chinese government's policies on these issues in 1996. So they are well established and deeply problematic. Uh, Mr. Mikachi mentioned earlier Xi Jinping's comments at the Seventh Tibet Work Forum in late August, doubling down particularly on education issues. Clearly, this is a vector of control uh, that, that the government and the party care about. What can be done? A few quick thoughts. I think there's room for the U.S. government to support any and all mother tongue language education efforts, including preserving and developing Tibetan language materials such as textbooks. There are also Tibetans who don't speak Tibetan. Those, those uh, language rights needs to be, need to be respected as well. There's room to support robust scrutiny of the Chinese government forthcoming U.N. treaty body reviews. 
mounting evidence of similar tactics across China urgently push Chinese officials to allow ethnic communities to use their own languages how and they when and how they see fit, particularly in education. I also want very much to encourage commissioners to find a way to support the call by 50 UN human rights experts published in late July calling for heightened scrutiny of China at the Human Rights Council. It is time to end Beijing's sense of impunity for a host of gross human rights violations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's testimony. Um, uh, uh, I'm gonna ask questions at the end. Uh, and I think Senator Rubio just uh, had a step out. So this is the order that I'm gonna yield to people. Uh, 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 Smith, King, Swazi, Cotton, uh, Hustler, Peters, McAdams, Danes, and Levin. Um, I'm not sure everybody's here, but I'm told that they may be. So let me, at this point, yield to uh, uh, Congressman uh, Chris Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for pulling this hearing together. The witnesses were extraordinary. Uh, I am ranking on Africa, and we have a hearing going on, so I'm going back and forth, so I apologize uh, that I missed the opening. I do have a statement I'd like to make a part of the record without objection, uh, an opening statement. Uh, just a couple of points, and um, uh, you know, I, I thought Dr. Richardson, your points about uh, the mother tongue and, and the the language issues, the education issues. Um, you know, this has been a full court press for seventy years uh, uh, to displace uh, the Tibetan Buddhists of, of their own country and of their own culture and, and their faith. Um, I'm wondering, you know. Uh, if there's, you know, it's 70 years of a genocide. We, we're all talking about, as we should, the genocide that's being committed, uh, Xi Jinping's genocide against the, uh, the Uyghurs, the Muslim Uyghurs. Uh, but just because this has gone on for decades doesn't make it any less egregious. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's movement, and I agree with you with the UN Human Rights Council, there needs to be, you know, some very bad actors help control their agenda. Um, and China has been, disproportionately effective in mitigating any kind of scrutiny that is really serious. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, should we mount also in addition to the bill I mentioned earlier, which I'm happy to be the Republican co-sponsor as ranking member on this commission uh, and former chairman. I want to thank again the chairman for introducing it. Uh, hopefully the Senate will take it up soon. Uh, but this is an ongoing genocide. And if perhaps some of you could speak to uh, what the Dalai Lama himself has written about, and that is the Han Chinese population transfer, uh, where they systematically bring people in to displace the uh, indigenous Tibetans uh, over time. And, you know, how uh, poorly or well has that worked? I've, unfortunately, probably all too well. And, and finally, on the whole synthesization of religion in all faiths in China, um, I and others, uh, all of us are concerned about how uh, Xi Jinping has made it a matter of absolute dogma that all faiths have to comport with his his principles. Um, you know, we see unfortunately a lot of kowtowing going on. Um, you know, some church bodies are doing it. Um, you know, they're some are doing it very reluctantly. Uh, but with the Tibetans, it's been seventy years of this, and I'm wondering if um, you know you could speak to. How we push back on that further, because again, these are violations of internationally recognized human rights. So, if you could speak to some of that, the the seventy year genocide, the time we called it that. I mean, you just read the genocide convention, and no matter who's a party to it or not, um, you know, there needs to be, I think, a focus on uh, what they have done horrifically, and and do we think the Panchen Lama is still living? I mean, I'm we're all concerned about that as well. And I thank you, Chairman. Yield back. Thank, thank you. Do you, are, are, you, you want any one in particular answer those questions, or uh, Dr. Richardson? Maybe uh, but I want to speak to that, you know, particularly on the UN and the whole idea of genocide, and any others who would like to jump in. So, if you could speak. Yes, <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Smith. Um, it's a it's a huge question, and maybe what I can what I can suggest is that. Uh, we have a very long conversation about whether the high threshold uh, that's set out for genocide claims uh, is is met. That that's an enormous conversation in and of itself. Equally important, I think, and hopefully most salient to members of this commission, is how you go about getting to or creating a competent court that could hear this. You know. There are many roadblocks in the path to accountability, particularly for China. 
Uh, you mentioned the, the, the challenges at the UN's uh, Human Rights Council, those exist. But there are other ways of getting to that point. You know, the, the Secretary General, the High Commissioner can, uh, you know, appoint a standing mandate to look at these issues and report back to the Council. There are other mechanisms for the formation of ad hoc tribunals. And I think that's as much of a challenge, uh, a, a political and a diplomatic challenge, as the legal discussion about the thresholds of genocide. So I, I'm happy to try to elaborate on it if, if that's helpful. I don't think I can answer the eight other questions I just counted you asking right now. Well, thank you, sir. Unless you want me to, I can try. <laughs> the chairman's got the time. Mr. Chairman, can I, can I add a quick uh, point to uh, Sophie's answer? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say, you know, I think the uh, slow moving genocide of the Tibetan people by the Chinese government is a real phenomenon. And even as recently as 2014 and 15, um, a judge in the Spanish High Court examined the evidence and concluded that what the Chinese government perpetrated against the Tibetan people was crime against humanity and genocide. And one thing that we got to keep in mind, I think it's very important is one genocide begets another. And what we are seeing absolutely right now in Xinjiang, which the Uyghurs call East Turkestan, is looks very much like the beginnings of a genocide. And one huge reason why this is happening right now, why the Chinese government, even in a supposedly anti-colonial era, even in the 21st century, in the beginning of the 21st century, is able to recklessly do this operation in Xinjiang is because they were emboldened by the silence of the world when the genocide was happening in Tibet. If the world had been more actively and proactively opposed to the Chinese genocide in Tibet, they would not be able to do this to the Uyghur people right now. So these incidents, what's happening in Tibet, what's happening in Xinjiang, what's happening in Hong Kong, these are all connected. And when we uh, come up with solutions to each of these problems, we have to, absolutely keep the bigger historical picture in mind and come up with solutions to the entire scenario. I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are, are, are we all set, Mr. Smith, you think? I, th I think so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I, I want to now yield to Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I'd like to start with a with a question to Mr. Dorji or uh, Mar Markashi. Um, why, why is China doing this? China's a massive company, a country. Why are they wasting all this time and energy on a country of six million people uh, on the very edge of their sphere of influence? What, what's what's this all about? Yeah, I I can take that. I um, I would say I mean Tibet is uh, of strategic importance for China for many reasons. I mean the the size of Tibet itself, if you look at the map of the Tibetan plateau, is uh, as big almost as you know Western Europe, and uh, for centuries that region has served also as a buffer zone with India and with other regions in Asia. So the decision of the Communist Party. You know, 70 years ago, right immediately after the, you know, the revolution took over, they decided to invite Tibet as a plan really to consolidate the rule and, uh, you know, protect itself from, you know, external influence. You know, there have been influence in, in Tibet from the British. India had a special relationship also with the region. So there is geopolitical reasons why Tibet is important. Also, Tibet is an area of immense natural resources. Eight of the major rivers in Asia come from Tibet, from the big river to Brahmaputra and other places. And as many analysts say, it's possible that the next wars will not be about oil, but will be about water because of global warming and the scarcity of water in the region. And we have seen a recent episodes in which uh, there have been reports in which uh, the Chinese government has used the dozens of dams that they have built on the rivers in Tibet, which have been used to slow the, 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 the flow of water to downstream countries. Last year, there was a drought in Cambodia, in Vietnam, on the Mekong, while apparently in the northern part of the river, there was a lot of water. 
Then there is the, the recent, as you have seen, the recent uh, skirmishes and, you know, fighting at the border with India. Uh, that is mostly about, you know, uh, the border that previously was with Tibet. And uh, in, you know, in military terms, if you control a, a plateau, you are an advantage point uh, from, from the military point of view. Then there is another issue. I think it's a cultural issue. Um, Every authoritarian government has an inclination to try to control spiritual power. We see that many conflicts in the world are connected to religion and the need to control religion. So the, the, the Tibetan identity is strictly connected to Tibetan Buddhism. So for them, uh, for the Chinese Communist Party, first of all, was an ideological struggle, struggle to try to destroy religion as part of their ideology. But then when they realize that the Tibetan connection with religion is so deep, now they have moved to the idea of trying to have total control on religion and use religion as a way to legitimize their power. Their problem is that the Dalai Lama is the most respected you know, Buddhist leaders for the Tibetan people both and for Tibetan Buddhists, not, so, not only all over the world, but still inside Tibet. So they lack legitimacy. And so the call for dialogue with the Dalai Lama, the goal for a political solution actually would be in the Chinese interest if they really want to try to, you know, stabilize the situation. But unfortunately, what we have seen even at the last, you know, Tibet World Forum is that the Chinese government continues to try to pursue assimilation and total control uh, to, to maintain their grip on power. And, and if I could add very quickly to Matteo's answer, that's exactly the reason why China is throwing caution to the wind and going all out in Tibet and uh, in East Turkestan. And legitimacy at the heart of it. The Chinese government knows that it has no legitimacy in Tibet and Xinjiang. And because of that problem, it makes them very insecure. And it's Beijing's fundamental insecurity that makes the Chinese government pursue these genocidal policies because at the end of the day, their goal is to destroy the Tibetan people and the Uyghur people as an ethnic group or as a religious group because they want Xinjiang without Uyghurs and a Tibet without Tibetans. It was interesting. You used the word insecure. That was the exact word I was thinking of. It's an insecure regime that has so much power and so many people and so much economic power that can't tolerate the slightest uh, uh, deviation. That's, a, that's an indication of insecurity. Let me ask, and I don't know if any of you know the answer to this, but uh, 20 years ago, or a little, bo little more than 20 years ago, uh, China was uh, admitted to the, uh, to, uh, to the WTO. The assumption was that integrating China into the world economic community would uh, lead toward a liberalization, a, a kind of opening up of a market society, which would lead uh, then to uh, some level of democratization. Manifestly, that hasn't worked. And uh, the only real, we, we can't intervene directly in the internal affairs of another country or how they're uh, relating to their neighbors. Uh, on the other hand, trade is certainly an important part of this message. How much of China's economy, if anyone knows, is dependent upon exports? Uh, to the rest of the world, to America or, or the rest of the world. Does anyone have a guess or, or knowledge of that? What I'm getting at is it strikes me that the one real power the rest of the world has is economic. Uh, and if China's substantially dependent upon exports, the rest of the world can say, we're not going to buy anymore until you start uh, acting like a, a mature, uh, responsible and secure uh, country. Um, and, you know, if you had a store in your town that was discriminating terribly against its employees and was doing all kinds of human rights abuses, people in town wouldn't buy from them anymore. And then if they wanted to stay in business, they'd have to they'd have to clean up their act. Uh, any any thoughts on uh, on that? Because that that strikes me and we can do sanctions and we can do uh, resolutions and such. But uh, the uh, power of, of the economy, it seems to me, is the, is the most substantial power. And it shouldn't be just America. It should be a, a, a worldwide uh, a program. Uh, if we do it alone, then, it's, then it loses its, its uh, strength, it seems to me. Any, any thoughts from the witnesses? I, I, would only, I would only say that the power of economic sanctions against a regime like China 
would have worked effectively in the 80s or in the 90s. Today, I think we have to think larger than economic sanctions alone if it is to work. And Ai Weiwei, uh, just in an interview uh, this past week, has said it is too late to curb or contain the Chinese regime's power. And I think it is actually too soon to give up. And because America and the uh, liberal democratic order in the West was partly responsible for bringing the genocidal regime of China into the global community of nations back in the day, I think we also have a fundamental responsibility right now to make sure that this regime changes its behavior. And in order to do that, I think uh, economic sanctions are a great place to start if and only if we think beyond that and start thinking about moral, political, cultural isolation of this regime, the way we did it with the regime, in the, the di dictatorial regime in South Africa during apartheid. I think we have to reach back into history and look for some of these more expansive uh, measures of isolating the regime. Thank you, very, very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Swazi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the work of this commission is so important. Uh, this is, as everybody's spoken, the, the Chinese Communist Party has a 70 year head start. Uh, and, you know, taking all the information into what's going on uh, and getting it through this commission and out to the public is so important considering this has been going on for such a long time. 61 years ago, the Dalai Lama was exiled from his own country. 25 years, the, the Panchen Lama was abducted. Uh, so similar to what Angus talked about the WTO, ever since Nixon went to China, we thought the more they were exposed to us and the more that they were exposed to the rest of the world and, the, and democracy and the world economy, the more they'd become like us. That simply has not happened. And we see it has been uh, testified so many times. We had our hearings on the Uyghurs. You know, we heard language, crimes against humanity, forced sterilization, forcing people to eat pork when it's against their religion, forcing people to eat when they're supposed to be fasting. I mean, it's, you know, we see it with the, with the Hong Kong students and the protesting that's going on. Uh, we see it certainly with the Tibetans. There was an article uh, September 21st from Reuters. The first, li the first line is, China is pushing growing numbers of Tibetan rural workers off the land and into recently built military style training centers where they are turned into factory workers, mirroring a program in Western Xinjiang region that rights workers have branded coercive labor. So, I mean, this is, this is the Chinese Communist Party has an overwhelming, sophisticated plan to dominate the world economically, militarily, in space and land. And see, you know, Angus, Senator King referred to, you know, Tibet being the edge of their sphere of influence. Well, with the Belt and Road Initiative, we know their sphere of influence is much, much bigger than that. And, and they want to influence the whole world, and we see how they treat their own people. So I think it's important for us to constantly educate Americans as to what the Chinese are up to. And I don't even know if my colleagues are aware, it was referenced briefly by some of the folks here, but was, I think it was just last week that a New York City police officer was arrested because he was working for the Chinese Communist Party to spy on the Tibetans. They actually have a recording of him uh, talking to Chinese officials saying, go to the same center you and I, Chairman McGovern, did our hearing at. They said, make sure you go to this Tibetan center and you can watch what's going on there so you can see who's uh, trying to undermine the Chinese efforts. In, 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 in Elmhurst, Queens, uh, just outside my district in Grace Men's district, we had a, 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 a rally in February of this year where we talked about the Elmhurst Library was showing a historical uh, 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 propaganda from the Chinese the Communist Party about the history of China. It was completely misleading to talk, didn't talk about the Tibetans. So the Tibetans rallied against it. And we got them to take that down at the Elmhurst Library. And we hear about the Confucius centers on a regular basis. So I want to ask, you know, with the, 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 the Chinese have a sophisticated, well-organized economic propaganda uh, 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 
plan, not only in their own country, but to export what they're doing in their country to other parts of the world. So I want to just ask the witnesses, can you give any other examples of things that we should be conscious of that the Chinese uh, are doing uh, uh, beyond their borders, you know, that we should be, especially in the United States. So I talked about the police officer that was arrested for spying and the Confucius centers, the, uh, uh, the, the, the propaganda at the Elmhurst library. What, give us, what else are they up to that we need to be conscious of? We know the Uyghurs, we know about the Hong Kong students, we know about the Tibetans. What, what do we need to be conscious of? Uh, if, I, if I may be glad, um, Congressman, good to see you. Thank you, Mateo. And uh, I think one, one issue that we should pay attention to is the plan of the uh, Chinese media to expand the operations worldwide. Over the last four years, both the, both the new state agency and the you know, Chinese state TV, they have expanded to dozens of languages all over the world. So they basically take advantage of their entrance in the WTO and they have free access to the markets in the world and they are promoting, they use these tools for propaganda. At the same time, they do not open the huge Chinese market to any foreign media to be able to broadcast in China. Even the New York Times, you know, Chinese website is not available in China. So this goes back to the question of reciprocity and also to the question that you know, uh, Senator King asked before. Uh, certainly export is a huge part, you know, in the Chinese economy. But what China has been able to do is to take advantage of the economic opportunities outside, using with the strategic goal or expanding their influence while at the same time restricting access to foreign companies in China, especially when it comes to media, as you know, social networks, you know, Google, they're not allowed to have access to the Chinese market. So I think now many business people now realize that this is not sustainable, that you cannot allow Chinese companies to have access to their own internal market with this sort of monopoly, and then having free access to the markets all over the world, how can you compete with that? So I think that the question of rebalancing and calling for reciprocity and stopping those activities that are not reciprocated by China in the US, I think it's a, it's a sound uh, approach to try to, to counter that effort. Thank you, Matteo. And if everybody could just give me one brief thing that they think they be aware of, maybe Tenzin Dorji, if you could give me uh, Tenzin Tashi Delay. Can you give me one? Hi, good to, yeah, thank you. Good to see you. Uh, I think there are there are plenty of examples. Just this past week, um, I think we should also be uh, paying attention to uh, things that are happening inside the U.S. as well as outside the U.S. And there, a couple of years ago, people might remember uh, there was a Tibetan, uh, uh, actually a Chinese agent who was ethnically Tibetan in Sweden, who was arrested in Sweden. And uh, just this past week, the Swedish uh, court decided to deport this Chinese agent working for the CCP. He was spying on the Tibetan community in Sweden. And I think that's, you know, it may be happening in Sweden. Uh, it's a small country, but I think we got it. Uh, it. It's a very good indicator of what the Chinese government is doing because- What's happening in New York City? I mean, it's yes, happening yes, right absolutely. inside my, my I, district. Absolutely. The, it's, it's a, there is a very, very small Tibetan community in Sweden. And even on a small community, less than 100 people, even on a small community like that, the Chinese government is investing tons of resources spying on that community. And the new case is exactly the same. In many ways, uh, the Tibetan community, among the Tibetan community, uh, we, have, we have suspected for a long time that the Chinese government was sending agents, yeah. informers, and their main goal, you know, they have a, a twofold goal of doing this. And the first goal is, of course, to collect information and data and, you know, uh, from the local Tibetan community. And the other is to influence the community, actually. And this particular uh, Chinese agent who was arrested uh, last uh, a couple of weeks ago, he, it was very clear that what he was trying to do was to influence the Tibetan community not to engage in political activities. And he was wearing an NYPD uniform. And yeah. in the Tibetan community, there is a respect for, uh, high respect for law enforcement, and he knows that. And, um, and I think 
the Chinese government's main goal in this case is to divide the Tibetan community in order to destroy the Tibetan movement because they are really fully aware that the t global Tibetan community, especially in the West, especially in America, have been extremely successful at inflicting a huge PR cost to the Chinese government. They've played a huge role alongside our supporters in exposing the brutalities of the Chinese government. And that's why several years ago, the Chinese government decided that they were not only going to crush the Tibetan people inside Tibet, but they were actually going to start paying attention to crush the Tibet movement globally. And this is part of their master plan. And what happened in New York is basically a tip of the iceberg. Okay, thank you. I don't know if I have time left, but Dr. Richardson, just briefly. Yeah, Mr. Swazi, if I can make this even a little bit bleaker, uh, because the problem is that you don't even just have to be Tibetan or Chinese to be experiencing these problems. About three weeks ago, Human Rights Watch led on a global civil society sign-on letter directed at essentially at accountability for China at the Human Rights Council. And groups from Vietnam and Venezuela and Azerbaijan signed on. We had two groups in the United States that do not specifically do work inside China decline to sign even anonymously because they were afraid that it would be known they had joined and that it would compromise their ability to get ECOSOC status to be able to carry out advocacy of the United Nations. Okay. That's a serious problem. Very serious. All right, thanks everybody. To do che, how, how do I say it, Tenzin? To do che? Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your good work. And I know a lot of people are, are really working hard, and we just want you to know that we support you, and this commission will continue to try and uh, provide a voice uh, for people that are really voiceless in this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. You. Uh, uh, Senator Cotton. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Representative Hartsburg. Senator Peters. Representative McAdams. Senator Daines. Representative Levin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here and I'm happy to go. I know other people are running around um, with all our competing activities. But there's none more important than this one. Um, and I'm uh, really uh, honored to that you allowed me to participate in today's hearing. And um, I've got a lot of things I'd like to ask about. So let me jump right into it with this amazing panel of witnesses. Um, so we we've heard about numerous reports of the Chinese government tracking and harassing harassing the Uyghur diaspora through WeChat, through its embassies, through malware, um, and these instances include coercing Uyghurs to refrain from activism and return home, possibly to be jailed by threatening their family members in Xinjiang, and this has come up this morning. Uh, let me ask you, Ms. Mr. Mikachi, it's great to see you. Uh, a couple of questions about this. Um, talk about how the Chinese government may be subjecting the Tibetan diaspora to uh, extraterritorial coercion and harassment. Uh, you know, what, what is going on here? It's very troubling. I don't know. Mateo, we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I forgot. No, no problem. Yes. Uh, so I think Tenzin has already mentioned, you know, one yes. very clear example of pressure that is put on, you know, Tibetan diaspora everywhere in the world. I mean, uh, we're talking about people who have either escaped from Tibet because of the repression or who are now the second generation of Tibetans abroad. And for many of these people, uh, you know, they have a very strong connection with Tibet. Many of them have families. So the idea of being able to keep contact with the families and travel there, it's a, it's a very important issue you know, for every diaspora community because the goal in the end is to be able to go back to your land. And so China basically has weaponized the question of access to Tibet. And as it came out clearly for the, from the indictment of the FBI uh, that has been published on the you know, Chinese Pie in New York, 
the Chinese consulate is using pressure, uh, uh, whether providing visa access to Tibet is a way to try to either recruit uh, new spies by offering that opportunity for people to go back or denying access to those who you know, uh, participate in the Tibet freedom, of, freedom movement activities. And this is very concerning because this is a way also to create suspicion in a community, because if people start thinking, you know, who got the visa to be able to go to Tibet and why did they do that? So I think it's very important that law enforcement um, look into that. And, uh, you know, for, for example, for former political prisoners, there are, you know, people who have escaped from Tibet if they testify, if they do activities, they, their families are in danger. Their families continue to receive calls. They get visits from you know, Tibetan officials and Chinese officials in Tibet. And so this kind of intimidation is really affecting the Tibetan diaspora. And uh, you know, Chinese influence all over the country, all over the world is increasing. So these actions are only going to, to continue to increase. Thank you. And I thought Tenjin, Tenzin's uh, written testimony and what you said this, this morning was really powerful. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, New York Police Department officer who was charged with spying. What, uh, what kind of information is China hoping to glean from agents like this? And is there a reason to believe that there's a larger campaign underway to spy on Tibetans in the U.S. You've talked about this some, but I'm particularly interested in this kind of, um, you know, an actual using people in the in a police department or other uh, official positions like that. And what should the U.S. do? What can we do to prevent this kind of horrific thing from happening? Thank you, Thank you. Representative Levin. Um, in the, I would just, yeah, I'd like to, uh, add very quickly the part about the identity of the agent who was arrested in New York. Uh, many in, in in many of the media stories, um, he was uh, identified as a ethnically Tibetan working for the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, one thing about his identity, you know, there was while there was no doubt that he was a spy for the working for the CCP. There was actually a great deal of doubt surrounding his identity. Um, many of the Tibetan people in the community, including the community board leaders and others who actually met him in person, um, they do not think that he is actually Tibetan. Uh, and there were a couple of reasons uh, for that. When he first met them, uh, he could not understand the Tibetan language. He could not communicate in the Tibetan language at all. And he said he, he was Tibetan, uh, but people who spoke with him said that he could not speak the central Tibetan dialect, the mainstream standard dialect. He could not speak the Amdo dialect. He could not speak the Kaba dialect. And of course, uh, there are Tibetans who have good reason not to be able to speak Tibetan, but not if you are from Tibet. And there was, you know, the other thing is he mentioned to some people that he was from this place called Gerong in far eastern Tibet. And the thing about Gerong is, if you were really from Gerong, you have a good excuse not to be able to speak the standard Tibetan dialect, because in Gerong, you speak a different dialect of Tibetan. But in that case, there would have to be somebody from the Gerong community who can verify that this guy is somebody from their village and they know him. There is no such person in, in the entire community who has verified that they know they knew this guy from back home. So, so, that's so who do you suspect. think he might be? Who do you think so he, he might be? So the thing, the thing that we know about him is that uh, his parents, both of his parents work uh, in the Chinese Communist Party. They work for the CCP which makes it extremely unlikely that he was actually somebody who was persecuted in Tibet or in China. While his, uh, while his story to the United States court, while applying for political asylum, he's somebody who came here then applied for political asylum saying that he was persecuted back home by the Chinese uh, government. So he was clearly lying in his entire story. That means 
we don't know what else he's lying about. So that I just want to put that out there. And it seems that there were two things that uh, these agents from the Chinese government usually try to do. One is they want to infiltrate the community so that they can get as much information as possible. And one goal of this information is to link people who are in exile to people who are in Tibet. And once you make that link between exile and inside Tibet, then the Chinese government is able to use that relation in order to execute their repression. There are multiple stories of uh, Tibetans who are able to go to Tibet and at the end of their meeting with the United Front Work Department or the uh, Chinese uh, security people who come to see them, they tell Tibetan Americans or Tibetan French, or, you know, Tibetan Europeans with Western passports, they were told by the Chinese agents that you, you know, you have a foreign passport, but always remember that your family here do not have one. And it's a very clearly, very, you know, thinly veiled kind of threat. Uh, and that's one purpose that they use this information for. The other purpose is to depoliticize the Tibetan community. Like uh, Mateo said, they want to create doubt and suspicion within the community. And that's an age old time tested tactic of the Chinese government through the United Front Work Department. Uh, Professor Anne-Marie Brady has called these things, these tactics, China's magic weapons. And the Chinese government purposely uh, use these kind of weapons, right? And once they, they do this for the Tibetan community as well, they try to sow doubt, make people sus uh, suspect each other. And once you have created that kind of doubt within the community, then people don't actually need to be real spies or informers. You just divide the community and destroy the movement. And that's what China is trying to do to the Tibetan community. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I have more questions, but I don't I don't see a clock, so I don't want to abuse my time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm so used to the rules committee where there's no clock that sometimes it's <laughs> going forever. But uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, let, let me just um, before I ask my question, I want to make sure that everybody's been um, with Senator Danes um, and Senator Cotton. Um, just want to make sure because I see them up here, but I just want to make sure that we don't uh, over overlook them. All right. Well, let me let me um, um, uh, let, let me ask a, a series of questions here at the end. Uh, uh, and this is for Rinpoche. Um, you know, as abbot of the Tashi Lumpo Monastery, you divide over the traditional seat of the Panchalama. Uh, can you talk about what the Panchalama means to you? Uh, and the monks in your monastery. Uh, after 25 years of his enforced disappearance, uh, what does he mean to Tibetans more generally? Uh, do you, yeah. do you think he's still alive? Yes. yes. Chun Anichi Tendeki 
chedu kule tsame kyo bata kyo bata ndo mazebe teda ki chedu zeto khang yo bata zeba teda teda ani beje ni la yang ani ku ku me nang xin che ani kong sa cho ki kong xi xi zun che che ani ji ki lap chi pe mi ji ki lap chi ki u chi ata de ni ji nang tu ya le ya pe mi se be eh tu ben so bu chi ta ani zam ni ji le xi de lap chi ji ni kang tu ya ki tan do chi bu yo de uh, thank you very much for the question on the Panchen Lama. Uh, the Panchen Lama, his importance and uh, what he means to uh, to our monastery at the Tashilumbu and uh, to the Tibetan people and Buddhists all over, it, it means so much for us. For his release would be a tremendous thing for us. It would mean the world for us. We miss his presence in our midst and uh, we are truly saddened so with the release of the Panjin Lama, the monastery and the Tibetan Buddhists all, everywhere, they would be, sh uh, you know, surely be overjoyed. And so uh, in a nutshell, uh, the Panjin Lama, his release would mean that firstly, the, this fact would reestablish the unique relationship of the Dalai Lama and the Panjin Lama in terms of their teacher-student relationship and in uh, recognizing each other's reincarnations, uh, you know, from lifetime to life. So this is an important and crucial point for us. And then if you look at uh, historically, uh, Tashulumbo Monastery has had an international base, even uh, when Tibet was free. So uh, scholars from different countries, neighboring countries would come to Tashulumbo for studies and scholars from Tashilumbu would go to different parts of the Himalayan region and to India uh, for the same purpose of uh, scholarship and learning and dialogue. So today also, currently in our monastery, the composition of the student uh, body is from different parts of India. We have students here right now from different parts of India, from the neighboring countries, and not just when students. So with the presence of the Panjin Lama, uh, with his uh, serenity, Tashilumbu Monastery would really flourish as an international center for learning. And uh, at the same time, with him in our midst and with his presence, the lineage of the Panjin Lamas will flower. And uh, this would be of tremendous benefit, uh, benefit to uh, millions of Buddhists. Uh, all over the world. And then finally, with his release, the Panjin Lama will have the opportunity to complete his religious mission and uh, spiritual practices in line with the vision and coordination uh, of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So these are, we would submit these uh, points for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Just one other thing, and I just, I just, just Senator Danes arrived, so I'm, I'm going to pass this and I'll yield to Senator Danes. But I just, are there any plan? Are there any plans or initiatives on the Panchen Lama issue that you want the commission to know about? That <laughs> Namanjabarimbape Anyway, uh, yes, we have a host of plans and initiatives, and uh, uh, CECC's help in these matters will go a long way in uh, in uh, in the success of our plans and initiatives. So please do support and help us. Uh, firstly, we have a book of Panjin Lama, 
uh, which will which will be released on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the Panjim Lama's abduction by the CCP, and then we plan to uh, distribute and share this book with interested people, uh, you know, across the world, uh, to create awareness and uh, present the tragic situation of the Panjim Lama. In our travels to different places, we want to uh, distribute uh, this book and meet different leaders and people uh, and to seek their support from all quarters. And uh, at the same time, uh, we have an initiative uh, and plan of visiting different countries in Asia, Europe, Canada and the USA, especially in DC in, in 2021. Uh, the basic initiative of this travel plan is to spread awareness about the late Lama's life, his contributions, uh, both spiritually and politically, and the struggles that he went through. And so basically we have this initiative of travel uh, to seek his release and uh, at the earliest possible date. And then finally, we also planning for an in-person hearing regarding the Panchen Lama's release in 20, uh, 2021 during our travels. So it would be of tremendous help uh, for your support and guidance in all our plans and in Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I see Senator Danes. Um, I'll yield to you if you have any comments or questions. Great. Th thank you, Congressman Governor. Much appreciated. And I want to thank you all for coming uh, before this commission and providing your perspective and expertise on this very important topic. Human rights, religious freedom, travel restrictions to and within Tibet are of keen interest to myself and this commission. Uh, Mr. Makachi, following the reciprocal access to the Tibet Act becoming law in December 2018, the State Department has issued two annual reports summarizing the level of access to Tibet and other Tibetan areas. Could you describe the impact that the passage of that act has had on U.S. policy and advocacy organizations work on Tibetan issues? Thank you, Senator Danes, for, for the question. I, I think the, the passage of the legislation has had a, a deep impact um, on U.S. policy, but also has encouraged advocacy organizations to continue to pursue that. Um, you know, the campaign for that bill started in 2014. And at the time, there was not much, you know, discussion about reciprocity between the United States and China. Now, today, we see that reciprocity is a key element to try to rebalance U.S.-China relations, not only on economic and financial issues on which, uh, you know, the Trump administration has been quite active, but also on questions related to freedom of movement, freedom of information, and access to the Chinese market for, you know, freedom of expression. Um, so the, the, the Congress, you know, when Congress passed the legislation, now has mandated the State Department to issue this report. And these are very important because they make an objective assessment of the, of the level of access granted to Americans. And the line, the initial line of the report is that you know, the Chinese government systematically prevents access to Tibet for American citizens. So this is a clear discrimination against American citizens and the reaction from the State Department to ban Chinese officials who are responsible for the, it's measured and appropriate. So this issue of reciprocity, what, what steps do you believe other countries might take to push the Chinese government on reciprocal access to Tibet and related issues? This issue has been at the center also of the recent discussion in the EU-China summit. You know, the EU leaders have started to talk about reciprocity, not specifically when it comes to access to Tibet, but in general in, with the relations uh, with China. And we have seen members of the European Parliament and other European, you know, parliament, national parliaments, endorsing this campaign and this principle uh, calling for access to Tibet. One point I would like to make, for this strategy to be effective, it needs to be international strategy. It cannot be the U.S. alone because mm -hmm. China has too much weight and too much influence on many other countries, and they would not be able to face that pressure unless there is a sound and solid coalition of like-minded countries working on this to put pressure on China. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Dorchi. 
Um, Mr. Dorji, as you know, the United States is not the only country to have recently imposed restrictions on Chinese apps. In fact, in June, India banned the use of the mobile communication platform WeChat. Could you discuss how this will affect the two-way flow of information into and out of Tibet? I think the flow of information between Tibet and the world outside, uh, there has been a lot of debate about it. And I fully understand that there are some people who have also argued that WeChat as an app may have a lot of problems, but it does have the bright side of creating more exchange and communication between outside and inside, between Chinese people inside China and the Chinese diaspora, between Tibetan people inside and the Tibetan diaspora. But one thing that I would like to highlight here is the app that is WeChat, it, it is basically in a while other apps, other digital apps are built for communication and expression. WeChat as an app is designed for censorship, self-censorship and state surveillance. As a result, right now, we can arguably, we can say that there is more communication between people inside Tibet and outside Tibet than ever before in history through these, uh, through, through WeChat, let's say. But the problem is, as Adrian Zenz uh, pointed out in a breaking story uh, article um, in Jamestown Foundation, what, chi what the Chinese government is doing in Tibet right now, especially in the TAR, moving half a million, close to half a million Tibetans into forced labor camps. This kind of uh, project that the Chinese government is running in Tibet right now, it took us half a year to find out that this was happening. And th I think this is a very strong indication that more communication and more exchange doesn't always translate into more understanding, mm -hmm. more awareness of what's happening inside Tibet. And that's why I think while banning apps in general uh, belong in the arsenal of illiberal regimes, it may seem like an illiberal tactic. While that's the case, an app like WeChat, which is meant to surveil people and keep people behind a firewall, there was a very, very strong case not to use those apps. And that's why I think India is doing the right thing by banning those apps. Um, and I think, um, I think the US also have to consider very strongly um, the weight, the argument for banning apps that fundamentally create censorship and self-censorship. Thank you very much for that thoughtful answer. I have a question for Dr. Richardson. Um, you recently wrote about the revival of a Mao era policing technique, which establishes uh, police stations, even in very small villages, turning neighbors on neighbors to watch each other. Could you describe how this is being applied and its impact in Tibet? Thank you, Senator Danes, for the question. We wrote recently about what are known as Feng Chao style police posts, which is a reference to uh, an approach to policing that was used in the Cultural Revolution. And it really has very little to do with actual policing or providing security. It is effectively a network for uh, surveilling people and reporting back on their political views. And you know, our, our concern is both about the expansion of the state's capacity to do that, but also the use of that label and the connotations that it brings to harken back to a, a, a decade of appalling human rights violations and to resurrect it as if that were sort of a positive reference point. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, for that. And thanks for your writing. Um, I have a question for the group here. I know I'm running out of time here, but I want to open the broader group here. It's, it's regarding the U.S. consulate closing in Chengdu in July. Um, and what effect that might have on uh, non-government organizations work in Tibetan areas. And then what does that also mean for Tibetans access to the outside world? 
If I may take that one, uh, I mean, the Chengdu Consulate was uh, an advantage point for all information, you know, about the situation in Tibet. But it must be said that the level of access granted to the U.S. diplomats there was very, very limited. You know, the Chengdu Consulate is outside of the TAR, so they could operate more or less freely in the other Tibetan regions, but access to the TAR was very, very much limited. So I think what is important now well, for the State Department to do is to come up with a strategy to address that issue and probably also establishing centrally in Beijing a separate, you know, Tibet section that would deal uh, in, in, in Chengdu also would affect somehow also Xinjiang, although, you know, Xinjiang was covered from Beijing. But I think a, a strategy needs to be adopted to try to, to address that, you know, centralize and maybe even upgrade the, the the capacity of the embassy in Beijing to to operate and you know and have access to information, mm -hmm. but it's a loss in terms of you know uh, access to information there for sure. Thank you. If anybody if else has a add, thought, I'm happy to turn. Somebody else have a thought on that question? If I may add very quickly, uh, yes, the dates to that question of access for Tibetan people inside Tibet. And there was a very perverted mirror image of what's happening out here as well as what's happening inside there, which is. The Chinese government does not allow Tibetan people inside to have passports. And it's very, it's, it's often overlooked and it's not often talked about very much. But Tibetans in Tibet, by and large, do not and cannot get passports. And even those few Tibetans who were privileged enough and able to get passports in the past that they were able to use for travel outside the country, today, do not have those passports. Those passports have been forfeited by the government. They've been taken away from them. And they are basically adults who are being infantilized and kept under lockdown and not able to travel anywhere. So Tibetans inside Tibet do not have the freedom of movement uh, to travel beyond China. And they also do not often have the freedom of movement to travel within Tibet because Tibetans from Eastern Tibet are not often able to go to visit a place like Lhasa. That's like denying Muslims the right to go to Mecca. And I think those are also very important to keep in mind, which is, which is related to uh, how the Chinese government controls the movements of Tibetan Americans out here from traveling into Tibet. Thank you. Thanks for your, your very thoughtful answers. I'll turn it back over to uh, Congressman McGovern. Thank you, Congressman McGovern. Thank you very much, Senator. I see uh, uh, my friend, Congressman Smith is back. I don't know whether there are, you have any additional comments or questions or that's okay. Let me, I just have, I have one question and then I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll close up here. Um, uh, Chen Quanguo, uh, now the party secretary of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region was until 2016 party secretary of the Tibet Autonomous Region. Uh, what does his former tenure in Tibet and his current position in Xinjiang suggest for the future tra trajectory of repressive uh, policies in Tibet. Are, are policies currently in use in Xinjiang, including mass internment centers and the extensive use of coerced labor and mass uh, labor transfers, are they being reproduced in Tibet? And what lessons can the international community draw from how the ongoing rights abuses in Xinjiang um, have been handled? And I will open it up to whoever wants to take it. Yeah, if, uh, Mr. Governor, if I could jump in and try to also answer one of Mr. Smith's earlier questions. Uh, well, I think the, the kinds of human rights violations that we're seeing in the two regions are somewhat different. They are both grave and serious, and to fail to hold Chen Chuanguo and other senior Chinese government officials accountable in the legal sense for these violations is to continue to encourage them. And I do want to go back to the point about, or Mr. Smith's question about Sinicization, because we've talked about that with respect to ethnic minority and religious communities forcing a kind of political loyalty. But let's not forget that the Chinese Communist Party is carrying out similar campaigns and surveillance of ordinary people all across the mainland to create a model citizen. Uh, and let's be clear that if we saw violations of this scope and scale taking place in other parts of the world, I think we would be well underway to a kind of independent international investigation that would lead to some kind of accountability proceedings. And it is high time to move in that direction. Thanks. 
You know, as I as I mentioned uh, in my opening statement, I'm, I'm really concerned about the reports of mass labor transfers and training programs in Tibet. Uh, what what do you think about the accuracy of these reports? Anybody? I think preliminary information that we have is a bit different uh, about the number of people who have actually been registered versus trained. What that training is like. Uh, what it means, but I think the underlying pathologies are no less serious. I think the, the agenda in Tibet is to move enormous numbers of people out of farming, off the plateau, into physical communities and kinds of work that make them easily legible to the state, uh, that make their political and religious views and activities known, uh, and to essentially leech away a distinct identity and way of life uh, and, and to offer only one that involves being subordinate to the party's political demands. Anybody else have any final words before we uh, close the hearing? I would just like to thank Chairman McGovern and uh, Co-Chair Rubio and, and, and the entire commission for your consistent support to the Tibetan people. Uh, the Tibetan people, both inside Tibet and outside, are very much aware of your commitment and dedication, and uh, we truly appreciate uh, the fact that you champion this cause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let, let, me, let, me, Thank you. Let, let, me, let me just close by saying that, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I appreciate all the testimony, and I appreciate the uh, participation of my colleagues. I joked at the beginning of uh, the hearing, this is, uh, you know, that in, in the current political climate here, it's hard to get Democrats and Republicans to agree on what they have for lunch, right? But this is an issue that has brought us all together. You know, Speaker Pelosi uh, reminds us all the time that if we don't speak out against human rights uh, abuses in China, that we, we, don't, we have no moral authority to speak about human rights abuses anywhere else in the world. Um, it is so glaring, uh, the abuses that are going on, so clear. Uh, and what is really tragic is that it just seems like it's getting worse. Uh, and, um, you know, we are working with Congressman Smith and, and others. We, 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 have, we have probably legislated more on human rights issues in China and, with, and, and on Tibet than at any other time, you know, um, in our history. Uh, and um, and we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, we're gonna continue to call attention to what's happening because I think the Chinese government is under this illusion that uh, they can wear us all down. That, you know, that you know, if they, you know, that the attention span of many of us is about 48 hours and then we are, we're on to another topic that somehow this will just go away or, you know, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama is no longer with us, then we will no longer care about uh, about Tibet. Th that is a huge miscalculation. Um, none of us are going anywhere. Um, we are going to continue to focus in on this issue. And for the record, Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives have high regard for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We revere him. He's a man of peace and justice um and nonviolence. why as senator king uh, asked in the beginning why you know a country as big and as powerful um as china is paranoid and frightened of this peaceful monk is, is beyond comprehension but they are um and they continue to be determined to try to wipe out the tibetan culture the language the traditions um, and the Tibetan people have suffered greatly. Um, and I hope that people in, uh, who, are, who, are, who are still who are there, um, who are under great oppression, know that uh, we're gonna continue to be their voice. So um, this was a very powerful hearing. And, um, and, I, and, I, don't, I, and I, I, I just saw a Rambo Shade come on the screen. I don't know whether you have anything finally that you wanna say or have you said everything? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. And uh, so everybody, uh, thank you. This brings this hearing to a close.
Uh, we appreciate your your, uh, in, uh, your responsiveness to the questions, and please, everybody, be safe. Uh, the hearing comes to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.